with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Claire to talk to you about uh, the topic of on-site mentors. So take it away, Claire. Thank you, Connie. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the applause, Peggy. So I am going to be talking about some of the research I've been working on for the past five years. Some of this is what I'm doing for my PhD dissertation, but most of it is the more um, the larger research project. So the title is Teaching Presence in a Blended Learning Environment, Contributions of On-Site Facilitators. There is very little research looking at what facilitators do. These are the staff who are on the ground with the students. And the aim of our study was to focus on these. So this slide now is just a little overview of what I'm going to be covering in this presentation. Why is online distance education so important for rural schools? And I'll be describing the study, the facilitators, the training, and then a little of the theory that we used to analyze some of the data that we collected, a little about blended learning, and then looking at the teaching and social presence and implications for practice. And throughout this presentation, you'll notice these photographs. These are all taken from either the schools or the towns, these rural towns spread all across America, where we conducted our research. So why is online distance learning so important for rural schools? Well, about 30% of public school children are enrolled in rural schools. That's 10 million kids. Most of these are in very small schools, less than 400 students, and most of these are in very small communities, fewer than 2,500 people. Now, these school districts have problems attracting qualified teachers to rural areas, and they therefore have lack of access to advanced courses or AP courses. Schools are very important for these small communities. They're often the heart of the community. They maybe host a library. They have all of their sports activities going on that um, the community can bond over. So if a school is forced to close because it can't offer the courses and has to consolidate, that can really destroy the community. So many of these schools, rural schools, turn to online distance education to address some of these issues. Um, it can increase the educational aspirations and occupational possibilities um, in no small part because students are exposed to a greater range of ideas, especially if they're in a class, a virtual class with peers um, all across the country. One of the great things for me, at least in this research, was watching how these students interacted. We would have kids in the same class in Alaska, in Arizona, in Vermont, and they'd all be getting to know each other. It was wonderful. I'm reading your comments, Peggy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was listening to Mike's session, too, and I um, mentioned that later on. All right. So to start with, a description of the study. We ran a small pilot in 2006 with about 20 schools. And then we ran the study in two cohorts, 2007, 2008 and then the following year. It was funded by the IES, and it was a randomized control trial. So students enrolled in this online AP English Literature and Composition course, which was delivered by Blackboard. And there were five, <laughs> yes, Arizona's in there, five online instructors and approximately 600 students over the two cohorts. And each rural school had a one facilitator, so 93 facilitators, 93 rural schools. And as you can see, uh, these are all the states that we were in. Now, you may notice there are no schools in the south. This is because in the south, uh, in the southeast, schools tend to be larger and consolidated and therefore did not meet our criteria for being in the study, which was being in a community of less than 2,500 and having these very small schools. So our requirement for facilitators to take part in the study was they had to have a bachelor's degree and be a staff member at the local school. But they didn't need to be teachers 
because we weren't expecting them to teach any part of the course, so they didn't need to have English subject knowledge. What we did request was that the school, the course was taken during a particular class period each day, and the facilitator therefore had to be present while the students were taking the class. So as it turned out, half, about half the facilitators had an English background. Some were teachers of other subjects, and we had a bunch of non-teachers. We had secretaries, a principal, a couple of librarians, school counselors, technology assistants. We had a football coach. It was really whoever the school decided, or whoever the school said had a free period, or I think some planning periods were eaten up by this. Um, they could decide who would be the facilitator. Now the purpose of the study, as I mentioned earlier, was that we wanted to focus on the role of the on-site facilitator. And we also wanted to expand the facilitator because they are the person who is right there with the students. And in online learning, as I'm sure you may know, there are high levels of dropout. Students often report feeling isolated. And there are many reports that say online learning is just as good as classroom face-to-face -face learning. But we wanted to see, well, why can't you improve it? Why can't you improve academic outcomes online? So this graphic is um, an overview of the course structure. So there were five online, structure, uh, online instructors in cohort two. So the overview of the course structure was each online instructor had four virtual sections. And these were essentially independent uh, virtual classes. And each virtual section was made up of typically four schools. Uh, in some cases, the whole school would drop and the section ended up having fewer than four. But this meant that most instructors had between 15 and 25 students in each section. So overall, they'd have 60 to 100 kids. So all facilitators in our study got basic training. Basic training. Um, told them about their duties that we expected, which was being in the classroom during the class period and being there for troubleshooting, technology of the quizzes, locked up or students couldn't get into their accounts, um, being able to check the grade books, really communicating what was going on in the local school, being the eyes and ears in the classroom and communicating those things to the online teacher. They were given the responsibility of assigning a participation it is Arizona, Peggy. <laughs> well spotted. Um, ensuring the students observe netiquette and, and just keeping an eye on them so that they weren't cheating or plagiarizing and, and were really keeping on top of the work. And they were also expected to contact parents if necessary. Now, can you guess where this slide is? So our expanded facilitator duties in the intervention group, uh, we wanted to encourage facilitators to create a positive classroom climate. We wanted them to take a, um, take a learner-centered approach, attending to individual differences, really taking an interest in what the students were doing, getting to know them, calling them by name encouraging them to interact with each other in the classroom and online with their peers in the virtual classroom, encouraging them to get in touch with the teacher if they had any questions, either through Skype or instant messaging or email, all of these ways they could get in touch. Um, they were supposed to meet with them individually uh, regularly. This could mean once a week, once a month, five minutes after class, whatever they wanted to do. They really had to be there to support and motivate their students, as well as mod modeling time management and organization skills, and being a resource, just being someone in the classroom that students could ask questions of. So what we did was we acquired a bunch of 
we acquired a bunch of high school students and we got them to be actors and we took photographs of them and we recorded, we made audio recordings of them reading these scripts and we recorded eight different scenarios, some of which had come up in the pilot. So these um, audio clips were then embedded in the online training. And this is our, the lady that you see here modeling the, uh, being the model facilitator was actually our project manager, Beth. Who was herself was a wonderful resource. So then the online training was given in Blackboard over a two week period, starting just before the start of the course. It emphasized community building, it had numerous discussion boards, it included icebreaker activities. We were hoping that facilitators would bond with, through these shared activities, would get to know each other. Um, and part of the reason for this training was to give them some idea of what it feels like to be learning Blackboard. And some of them had not been on Blackboard before and had not taken online classes or taken part in online discussions. So it was new to many of them. And some of them were expressing that they were nervous. So they did um, bond and have conversations and share their personal lives and this kind of thing. We were hoping that these facilitators would continue to use each other as a resource throughout the year, but that didn't happen in the end, uh, primarily because of time constraints. They just were so busy, they just didn't have time to keep up with this. So the scenario-based training, these are the eight scenarios that we recorded. So there was the first day of school, suggestions for icebreaker activities, and then um, discussing it, the importance of discussing the expectations of the course with the students. Then we had a number of scenarios uh, about individual student issues that might come up, um, being scared of, of taking the online course or having a procrastinator, um, encouraging students to help themselves rather than relying on the, the local teachers to give them answers, encouraging them to interact online with their peers. Um, we, we had one scenario where we had a student who had moved from Chicago to a rural area and had been arrogant and then finds himself overwhelmed by the workload. We have one student who's having uh, personal problems and is disengaged. And then something that was very common in these classes is that they were worrying about their grades because AP grades, the teachers right off the bat said, well, if you're an A student, you're likely to be a C student in this class. And we had all the valedictorians worrying about how this would affect their grades. And we left it up to the schools to weight the AP grades. So the facilitators would then read and listen to these scenarios. And then they would go into the discussion boards and give examples from their own experiences and perhaps offer alternative solutions. Thank you, Peggy. So what we found after the first cohort was that, yay, intervention group schools had dropped out at a much lower rate, 11% than the control group schools. We were very happy with this. However, cohort two, there really was no effect on dropout. So what was different about cohort two? Well, cohort one had a number of teething problems. So there were only two teachers in 10 sections in cohort one. And teachers began with large numbers of students, more than 125 students each. and they were just overwhelmed in the beginning. They were getting more than 300 emails a day. They were unable to meet the needs of their students because of this. The curriculum had to be adjusted for all kinds of reasons. Schools were on block schedules, four-day weeks, because in these rural communities, students travel a lot for all kinds of you know, sporting events, this kind of thing. Um, and there were school closures for, for all kinds of other reasons that were unexpected to the teachers, um, for instance, this one school closed for a week because of the potato harvest. Um, the, in these small communities, there were a lot of community-based activities that, that took priority over schoolwork, and the schools would close, whether it was the county fair or homecoming or handing out flyers. So in many instances, um, having an online course was less of a priority. 
in cohort two, everything was very stable. Teachers began with fewer than 75 students. In fact, one teacher only had, I think, less than 50. And the curriculum was already set. So there were no changes. So uh, teachers were able to devote their full attention to helping the students. So what we found then was rather than just looking at the intervention versus control, we interviewed at the end of each cohort, we interviewed the online teachers and the facilitators. And we had the teachers rank the facilitators into three groups, whether they were good, meaning very effective, whether they were in the middle, moderately effective, or whether they were ineffective, which in some cases meant they were bad. Um, so these good teachers and bad teachers were distributed across the intervention and control groups. And these rankings actually predicted students' course grades, which we found very interesting because to us these seem, you know, highly subjective. So according to the teachers, these are the things that good facilitators did. Communication was very important. They kept in touch with the teachers regularly. Didn't mean, mean didn't need to be every day, but at least every few days. They kept the teachers informed of what was going on locally, weather conditions, who was absent, if the school was closed. They kept on top of the timetable and knew what deadlines the students had and what assignments they were supposed to be working on. They responded quickly to teachers' requests for information. In other words, they were more than just a warm body or a babysitter in the classroom. They had to pay attention to what the students were doing each class period. Did they look like they were working? They developed close relationships with their students, got to know them, spent time with them. In many cases, they already knew their students very well. Um, often they had seen these students grow up as they went through the school and had taught them previously if they were teachers. They also managed their classroom effectively and they advocated for their students. Now, less effective facilitators, there was really a whole range of different things. And these facilitators were not necessarily bad, although some of them were. Some of them were just over-caring or over-involved with their students. So they would do things like undermining the authority of the instructor. They would put local events with a higher priority than the class calendar and minimize the importance of the online class. Often they were just very busy people with multiple obligations in the school and they would therefore neglect their facilitator duties, often just being absent, sometimes taking weeks off at a time, whether for a good reason or not, but uh, without replacing, a, you know, getting a substitute facilitator. Uh, if there were kids struggling in the class, they didn't necessarily go to any great lengths to help them. They seemed to be less in engaged in their role, less responsive to teacher requests, in some cases, they would even interfere with the course timetable or curriculum, saying, well, I think that's too hard. You don't need to do that. Or being over-concerned with the welfare of their students, essentially trying to protect them from what they saw as unfair deadlines or overly rigorous work. And in one or two instances, unfortunately, they even had an adversarial relationship with the teacher. And uh, in a couple of instances, too, the, the students did not take the facilitator seriously. They had a lack of authority in the class. Exactly. It does sound, Peggy, it does sound like some parents who get overly involved. And the kids just rely on them too much and don't think for themselves. Now, when we interviewed the facilitators, of course, we had their perspectives. And they were doing a lot more than the teachers were aware of. For instance, some of them were leading content-related activities. Even though we weren't expecting them to take a teaching role, um, they would be leading discussions, particularly if they did have an English background, as about half of them did. Some of them were taking students to see movies and plays, or meeting outside school hours for study groups. Several of them were, were very involved helping their kids with uh, college readiness, college prep, emphasizing that taking this online AP course would be a really good experience for them going to college. As well as helping them with college applications, they shared their own experiences as learners. They really helped their kids 
not worry so much about the grade, to enjoy the class, not take things too seriously. They supported them, often feeding them cookies and pizza, and they would communicate with whoever was necessary to help the students succeed, whether this meant getting another English teacher involved to coach them, or involving the principal, or speaking to the counselors, or getting in touch with parents, or staff at the local colleges, whatever it took. And this is a really big one. They helped the students manage frustration with the lack of immediate feedback, because these, many of these students in small rural schools are used to these intimate, close learning environments. So many, most of them had not taken online courses before, and many of them had not taken AP. So it really was a steep learning curve for them in the beginning. Now, onto the theory, we, we, we used the community of inquiry, which is a construct that has these three presences. And in this particular study, we're, we're not looking at cognitive presence, which is where the learning occurs, but social presence and teaching presence, which support learning. Um, starting with, thank you, Peggy. Starting with uh, teaching presence. Now, it's teaching presence rather than teacher presence, because it, knowledge, it acknowledges that not all learning is transmitted between teacher and student. Students learn from each other, from their peers. And in this study, obviously, the facilitator is also a third party in this. So we found from the facilitator's descriptions of what they were doing in their interviews that the, their activities actually were contributing to all three areas of teaching presence. And these three areas are facilitating discourse, instructional design and direct instruction. Primarily under facilitating discourse, they were setting the climate for learning. And they were also drawing in participants and prompting discussion. Now, if I just go back to the community of inquiry, you can see the place where the social presence and teaching, social presence and teaching presence overlap, that shaded area that says setting the climate. Did facilitators sign any agreement? Not for their accountability. They had to sign, um, well, thinking back a few years here, they did have to agree to do the training. And we, we knew that they had done the, the training because they all logged in. And then all we could do was give them the, what we expected of them. And then the schools had to sign something saying that they would supply a facilitator to be present during that class period. But other than that, that's all they signed. So I'm focusing on this setting the climate shaded area, because that's what we feel that primarily is what facilitators are doing. Now, this is really drilling down into the teaching presence codes. And facilitators may not have been doing all of these things, but they were certainly doing some of these things. So under instructional design, Yes, they definitely added part bits to the curriculum when they, when they uh, had content-related activities in their classroom. They certainly were establishing time parameters and netiquette. Um, under the facilitating discourse, they were definitely encouraging, acknowledging, and reinforcing student contributions, drawing in participants, uh, but especially they were setting the climate for learning. And then under dis uh, direct instruction, they were doing most of these things. Yeah, thank you for the link, yes. So looking more at blended learning now, most definitions of blended learning refer to a combination of online and face-to-face, -face, such as uh, Garrison and Vaughan and the organic integration of thoughtfully selected and complementary face-to-face -face and online approaches and technology, which is perfectly fine, but these definitions often do not take into account what is happening in the local context. They're really just looking at the virtual piece. And they're from the perspective of the teacher. And indeed, this class, from the perspective of the teacher, was completely online. But if you take the other perspective from the learner, you'll realize that it actually is a blended learning environment. And Michael Horn's definition yesterday emphasized that students should have some 
element of control in this. And really, these high school students didn't have that much control. The, uh, although the course was asynchronous, it was still running on a 24-hour day. So all of their activities had to be uh, completed within this 24-hour period, and teachers would respond to them within 24 hours. And they took the class in, in school during a particular course period. So the conclusions on this piece of uh, the study were that, yes, indeed, the responsibilities for student success were distributed across the local and virtual classrooms and between online teacher and on-site facilitator. Facilitators did contribute to all areas of teaching presence. And as I said earlier, even though this course was completely online, at least from the instructor's perspective, the on-site facilitator contributions meant that students were actually learning in a blended environment. So what's important for practice is the main thing is a good working relationship with the online teacher to know what is expected of your role, because I know that facilitators have all kinds of varying roles, depending on how what model they're using. Because the, as a facilitator, you are the person who is right there in the classroom with the students. You can see the looks on their faces during the class period. Uh, facilitators are often called mentors in the literature, and that is the role and attitude that you should have, that of a mentor, that you should be learner-centered, pay attention to each student as individuals and be aware of how important you are to the success of your students. And here are some examples of just how important the facilitators were. Now, I'm not sure this looks rather small on my screen. I don't know if you can see these numbers, but this is a graph that shows the drop rate by facilitator rank. Now, these are the ranks that were given to the facilitators by the teacher. So the low ones were the ineffective, the middle ones were just in the middle, and the high ones were the very good facilitators as perceived by the teachers. And you can see here, or I hope you can see, that the low and middle ranks are hovering around 40% drop rate. That means 40% of the students in these local rural schools dropped out. In the schools that had a high-ranking facilitator, that drops to 30% or just under 30%. This slide is getting away from the local classroom to more to what I am looking at, because we did not have anyone observing and taking data in the local classrooms, unfortunately. We just didn't have the funding to. It would have been such fun to go out into the field and, and go to some of these small schools. But no, we're having to rely on facilitator reports. But what we do have is we have all of the archived Thank you, Peggy. We have all of the archived um, discussion board activity between students and teachers online, and that is the piece that I am looking at for my dissertation. So I could probably talk about this for 24 hours nonstop, if you know, somebody said I should. So looking at the discussion board activity, which is part of the course, um, it shows that even though the facilitators were in the local schools and not participating themselves in the discussion, that they had an effect on how engaged the students were in the course. So on average, students who had a facilitator who was ranked high or good posted 25 messages on the discussion boards. And in the low and middle groups, this was as low as 14 or 15. Did, you have to, did we have to teach the facilitators how to handle discussion? No. Well, in their online training, they participated in their own discussion boards, but they had nothing to do with the actual running of the course, the course content. So the only thing, they, they weren't responsible, and the only thing they had to do was encourage the students to participate. But we feel, or we speculate, that um, having a good facilitator meant that the students were more engaged. What skills do you credit for the discussion? I'll go back into the discussion at the end, if, that, if that's OK. Now, social presence, to go back to the community of inquiry model, if you can see the social presence ring there, is also part of what makes up setting the climate. And social presence addresses 
the question of how people project themselves online in text-based environments. How, how do they project themselves as real people with real personalities, emotions, affect, all those kinds of things. And social presence has three components, cohesive, affective, and interactive. Now, the, the cohesive part of that refers to um, the use of language that bonds the group together, such as using the terms we, us, or our when talking about the group rather than individuals. It also means sharing stories about your local environment, um, greetings, expressions of thanks, all of the social niceties, vocatives, which are calling each other by name. And then the affective component is, just as it sounds, emotion, humor, sarcasm, paralanguage, which means any embellishment of the text by using, for instance, smileys or other emoticons, exclamation points or other um, embellishment of the text, different colors, adding photos or links, anything that adds to the just the plain text. This also includes self-disclosure, um, which was uh, one of the most common indicators of social presence. And this means expressing vulnerability in some way, for instance, saying, um, oh, I found that test to be very hard. I really struggled with it. So it's, it's admitting some kind of uh, vulnerability or disclosing something about themselves personally. The interactive piece is acknowledging that there are other students re responding specifically to their posts, agreeing with them, complimenting them. It also includes complaint and whining. I should really go on to the next slide for this because it gives some more detail. Um, complaint and whining. There wasn't very much complaint and whining in the course at all, but it's considered a bonding activity because people often will bond through complaining about the same thing. Uh, disagreement means polite disagreement, so it's not having a, an argument and being mean, it's just often an academic critique. And then ask request, ask or request is um, asking deliberately, inviting further conversation by asking specific questions or asking an open-ended question. So it's trying to continue the conversation. And as you can see from the social presence indicators I have on this graph, um, now I've lumped together the middle and low because they tended to be similar. So the high in green in many cases are a lot higher than the middle or low. So again, you're seeing an effect of the students who had good facilitators were much more sociable, showed more social presence indicators in the language that they used on these discussion boards. So they were not only more active, but they used more social presence indicators. And social presence indicators are thought to be a measure of how communities form online. So of course, all of this is important when you're trying to create online, online communities. She was very responsive. Her kids always had their stuff done. If she, if they didn't, she knew about it and I knew about it. It was just communication, communication, communication. So that's a big thing. And then we have two differing opinions here. One facilitator saying that I think non-English teachers make better facilitators, meaning teachers of non-subjects other than English rather than non-English teachers. So their feeling was that if the English teachers didn't like the way they were teaching the class, then they'd try and take over and teach it their way. Well, we have another uh, online teacher who said, actually, she quite liked it if they helped the students with the content, because some students had low writing skills. So having someone there who knew what a paragraph should look like could give them all kinds of feedback and can say, here's a topic sentence, here's a thesis statement, that kind of thing. So she was happy for teacher, the facilitators to be helping with the content. And then just a comment about, again, about communication and, and how they developed close relationships with some of these facilitators. One would send me pictures every time one of her cows had a calf. And here's some comments about ineffective facilitators. And as I said, ineffective didn't necessarily mean that they didn't care about their students, although in some cases they really were absent. So one here saying that uh, he was worse than an absentee facilitator. He was the kind of facilitator that could cripple a class, made it difficult to have any kind of a bond with any of these students. It was adversarial. 
And then another one, she was too attached to the kids. She was mystified and thought the kids were mystified too and deserved a break. She tried to cut them some slack. And I believe that was a facilitator who said to the kids, well, I think this is too difficult so you don't have to do it. And then another one where she was just babying them too much. She was over-involved in trying to protect them um, from the rigors of coursework and, and what they saw as inflexible deadlines. And I believe, oh, we have facilitator comments on the teacher. So from their perspective, um, saying that the instructor was very accommodating when the local issues interrupted the class. She was wonderful. I felt like I knew her. We were in contact multiple times per day, per day and she was readily available. So again, communication. And then the rigor of the one, one facilitator liked the rigor of the course. The online teacher did not let up when they were having a bad day. It didn't matter. Or making excuses about other tough classes, sports, band, practice. Local teachers are all so swayed by that. You don't always need to be warm and fuzzy in education. The kids rose to the occasion because they were pushed. She was an excellent professor and we were all very impressed. And another one saying she was tremendous. She was very responsive. She, and again, she replied very promptly. And this last one always makes me laugh. One class and only one class used Skype. So she's saying that they used to instant message the teacher, but once they got a, set, a headset with a microphone and were able to carry on a verbal conversation, so the first boy to talk to her said, she's nice. And she said it brought a whole new feeling to the class to actually realize the instructor was a real person and not just some sadistic slave driving dragon which it is a wonderful comment. I love that comment. So you can see how important the relationship is here. And uh, that's the end of the presentation. And these are the credits. This is, it was funded by the IES. And again, these are probably too small to read, but the references that I used in this particular presentation. And contact information for me.